The world is a global village where borders have become places for people fleeing war-torn, dangerous countries to surge into, by any means possible, into the hope of a new life. But some countries in our global village are turning away from welcoming refugees and turning instead to protectionism. Nowhere is this more evident than in the United States, where President Trump announced that there's no room for more migrants. The thousands of illegal immigrants trying to enter our country. We are out of space to hold them, and we have no way to promptly return them back home to their country. Now as thousands of migrants in Central and South America flee their homelands, there is no common ground. More than 200 million people are migrating to find a home. Every living person deserves basic human rights of safety, peace, and freedom. And millions are risking everything, even their own lives, to find it. They're trapped between countries and governments their lives threatened as they make their treacherous journey in search of a new life. Today on Context, we go deeper into the migrant border crisis. I'm Lorna Duick. I'm Sheldon Neal. And I'm Molly Thomas. And this is Context. More than 7,000 Central American migrants arrived by caravan to chaos at the U.S.-Mexican border. And on New Year's Day, border agents reportedly shot tear gas into those crowds. We speak with freelance journalist Maya Averbuck, who has previously traveled with that caravan. Helping migrants in their time of need, we go to a Catholic shelter at the Tijuana-Mexico border where migrants and countless deportees are being sent back to Mexico. And here at home, migrants flocked to Canada from the U.S. after Prime Minister Trudeau tweeted they were welcome here. But relocating to Canada is not so simple. We have an update from Haitian migrants in Montreal. The international president of Doctors Without Borders joins us from Switzerland. Dr. Joanne Liu says there is no wall big enough to stop the current worldwide refugee border crisis. And two organizations that welcome refugees and migrants with open arms. How Micah House and Matthew House support people who come to Canada with nothing but hope and faith in the human race. In a primetime address, President Donald Trump reiterated his support for a border wall. He wants $5 billion to build that wall. The Democrats currently have $1.3 billion on the table for border security. But that's not enough for the GOP. Molly Thomas has the story. We will build a wall. It's the campaign promise that's brought Washington and the entire nation to a standstill. Public museums closed, parks unmonitored, and some public servants deemed essential working without a paycheck. The infamous building of a $5.6 billion border wall between the southern border of the U.S. along the Mexican border is meant to block undocumented migrants from crossing. In an ironic twist of fate, the land where the border wall is being proposed once belonged to Mexico. But in 1848, Mexico ceded it to the U.S. in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All these states once belonged to Mexico. So people who were literally once neighbors are now characterized by President Trump as enemies of the state. We're not criminals. We're coming over here because we want to work. We need a job. We need better, you know, a better life. A recent survey from NPR and PBS reports that nearly two-thirds of Americans don't believe the wall should be a priority. Trump is now threatening to call a national emergency over the issue and force the Democrats' hand at funding that wall. But that's no easy task, especially now that the Democrats have a majority in the House. Now, most opponents say walls won't work. They didn't in Berlin, Germany and they won't in the U.S. We want the symbol of America to stay as the Statue of Liberty, not a big concrete wall. The Tijuana-San Diego border is where migrants from the caravan who traveled through Mexico this fall have settled. And thank goodness there's a Catholic shelter there. And joining us from that location in Tijuana is Carlos Y. Quintera. Uh, you work with migrants of the caravan, Car Carlos. 
Tell us about this group of migrants and deportees, because you've been there, your shelter's been there for 30 years. How are this group of migrants different? Uh, thank you, Lorna. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Well, yeah, we're here in Tijuana. Uh, we have been here for 32 years, and part of the work has always been with uh, asylum seekers or refugees, and another big part with deportees. Right now, what we are seeing, it's, uh, it was just a bigger amount that we're used to here in Tijuana for the refugee part. We're normally used to a huge amount of deportees uh, all year long. They, we get deportees constantly. And what we do with migrants, uh, nevertheless, if they're uh, refugees, asylum seekers or deportees, is we uh, use a system system that we developed is a, a social insertion program. We have a whole team of professionals working to prepare these persons, these migrants, to find a stability, not just in, in like a tangible uh, physical uh, stability, but an emotional one that allows them to rebuild their life plans and to make themselves productive to society again. So here uh, you are working in those very deep longings. What are the mood, what is the mood like for those migrants? Well, at the beginning it was very complex. It was, uh, they were uh, desperate. Uh, a big part of it was because they didn't have an answer of when they were going to get into the U.S. or if they were going to get there at all. To, and if the U.S. was going to hear their applications and to uh, respect their rights to ask for asylum. Oh, that was a, a huge uh, internal conflict for them. Right now, it has been a couple of months, about a month and a half, almost, almost two. And what we see now is that people is actually uh, trying to understand the new reality. Uh, the ones living here at Casa with us, uh, they already had jobs, they have already had papers, uh, Mexican papers, and they are finding a, a new opportunity here. It wasn't what they were thinking at the beginning. It, it's, it's not the U.S., but it's a place where they can reveal their lives. Okay, Carlos Y. Quintera, what a complex gathering place you've got there, but thank you for being there and thank you for joining me. If you don't give me money, I kill you or I kill your husband, or I kill your children. So, we are here. So why are so many people from Central America on the move right now? Let's bring in freelance journalist Maya Averbuck. She specializes in migration stories and is in Mexico City today. Maya, I'm reading that uh, there are less Mexican mi migrants and more from the Northern Triangle of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. What is driving this group of people right now? So we've heard from a lot of the migrants who are coming from Central America is that they're fleeing from conditions that are, on the one hand, very violent. Many of them come from areas that are controlled by gangs and where they can't really rely on the police to solve the crime that is happening in their neighborhoods and are fearful that this will affect their families or it already has. And on the other hand, fleeing from conditions of pretty extreme poverty and are seeing a rising cost of living and are unable to make ends meet, whether that's because they are farmers living in areas affected by drought or whether they're just living in precarious circumstances with high rates of unemployment in urban areas. Um, and so for that reason, we've seen many more people starting to migrate to the US to seek asylum and many more women and children and entire families, whereas in years past, there were many more Mexican migrants and many more single men who were making this journey. So Maya, then uh, as someone uh, that has traveled with this caravan, has met people there, women and children you were talking about, uh, is it difficult for you when you hear the way that President Trump characterizes migrants when he speaks about them from the platform? I think what's most difficult is that it's deeply misleading and it sounds like he's never spoken to some of these migrants. And what's misleading about it is that he's very focused on cases of violence that have happened in the U.S., even though we know that in general the crime rate in immigrant communities is very low. And he is talking about dangers along the border um, in a way that doesn't take into account that 
many of the people who are coming um, are here to enter into a legal process that they have the right to enter into, whether they are crossing undocumented between ports of entry or at ports of entry, they have the right to come and ask for asylum. And they're asking for protection from the U.S. government. And it's very confusing to many of the migrants how exactly that process would work. And they're very fearful of what could happen to them as they go into those proceedings. But the pressures to leave um, in the countries that they're coming from are so high that they're willing to take on all of the risks that he's talking about, which is violence in, along the journey, um, which is assault against women, which is working with uh, coyotes or, or human smugglers to try to get to the border because they don't have other options. And so a lot of the discourse of the president doesn't match up with the conditions that people are facing in their countries of origin and doesn't take into account why they absolutely have to leave. So, uh, Maya, then what kind of pressure does that put on a country like Mexico when you are hosting people now that the U.S. is not allowing people to come across? Like, what kind of pressures are you seeing as you are traveling around uh, the country that you're in? Mexico has historically been a place where there is a lot of migration, right? There's a lot of migration that has always happened from Guatemala into parts of southern Mexico. And at different points of conflict, Mexico, either for people from Europe or also people from Guatemala, has served as a point for people who are fleeing to come and settle. That said, it's also been under a lot of pressure under the past several years from the U.S. to try to take part limiting the amount of migration and to up its level of deportations, which we saw, um, especially after the 2014 surge in unaccompanied minors. And so Mexico has found itself in this real bind where it keeps promising to give humanitarian protections to migrants. It has at different points provided them with shelter spaces that are monitored by the Mexican government, but at the other hand also deports thousands of Central American migrants um, and does so under a lot of the pressure from the U.S. Puts them in a very, very difficult position. Maya, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your time today and thanks for your reporting. Thanks so much for having me. Migration is not a crime, says Dr. Joanne Liu. She is the international president at Doctors Without Borders. She joins me now from Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Liu, thank you for being on the front lines of truly um, so many global crisis spots. But help us understand migration. Why is it not a crime? Well, migration is not a crime because someone who is living for his life or for a future shouldn't be criminalized for that. Nobody leaves their country because they have the choice. They do it because it's a no choice. They leave because there's a famine. They leave because there's a political uh, crisis. They leave because there's, there's a war. So um, we should understand that it is a choice that is a choice of a last choice. And what do we say to the overwhelming numbers, like 200 million plus people on the move? People are frightened that are at the border points saying, what do we do with this? Well, the reality is there's 250 million people who are uh, migration people. I belong to those people by working in Switzerland and being Canadian. But the reality is the number is smaller for the people who are fleeing like some hardship. And then we know that there's about 68 million refugees and internally displaced people in the world. This is the highest number since the World War II. Uh, and we know as well there's other type of migration like what we're seeing in Central America that we know every year half a million of people, either from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala or Mexico are moving towards the U.S. Do you think we have the heart capacity, the compassion capacity uh, in our free countries to handle this? I think it's a question of political will and, and it's a question of as well of solidarity. But it, it is important that, uh, that we don't turn a, a blind eye to what is going on to people's suffering. And uh, this is what we, it, it's, it's all about. It's, it's, it's important that we, um, we collectively understand that nobody will leave their country because they want to be uh, floating on a dinghy on the Mediterranean Sea, or they want to be 
uh, beaten or persecuted or extorted money on their way to the U.S. People do that because they think for their life. And I often say it's always the same. The, the, the motivation for parents, for future for their parents, for their children, is unbeatable. There will be no wall tall enough to prevent a parent to look for a future for their children. Dr. Liu, as uh, the president of Doctors Without Borders and as a Canadian, we're very grateful for you. Thank you. You've seen the worst of humanity and the best. Thank you for your work. Castle is the first video streaming service that's been created to serve you with high quality faith-based media for all ages and a live 24 seven prayer chat. Castle features Christian TV shows, documentaries, teaching series, and kids content. Start your free 30-day trial of Castle and discover this quality Christian resource made for your entertainment and your spiritual growth. Sign up now at intothecastle.com. In 2017, thousands of Haitian asylum seekers illegally walked over our Canadian border looking for a home. Cynthia and Bertholi Gaspar are pastors of the church L'Église La Mission in Montreal, Quebec. Haitians themselves, the Haitian migrant crisis strikes a personal chord. Pastor Cynthia, you said the biggest problem for Haitian migrants was reading the 2017 tweet from Prime Minister Trudeau. We have that on screen for us here. To those fleeing persecution, terror and war, it says Canadians will welcome you. Now, of course, the Trudeau government did backtrack on this, as many came to know the reality of what it really takes to come to Canada. What are Haitians now hearing about immigrating to Canada? They hear that it's more difficult than they mm, thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are not, well, well the, the thought is they are not welcome like they thought they were. And um, it's very uh, disappointed for them because uh, they, uh, they went to United States and thought that they can, could stay there. And then they hear that the United States, for them, the interpretation that the United States don't want them. And then they thought that Canada wanted them. And then they, uh, they has been diluted because uh, they say that, well, we're not welcome anywhere. So it's, there, there's a lot of desperation. You say there has been a decline over the last couple of years in the numbers you and your church are seeing from Haitian asylum seekers, some of them to which you helped find homes. Uh, what, what's happening now? A lot of them has been deported also. Uh, uh, they said in uh, 2017, uh, uh, in the Canadian Border Service Agency said that uh, 434 people has been uh, uh, deported. And in uh, 2018, it's 70, 67 people. So the total is 501 people has been deported. And question somewhat to both of you, why do so many Haitians, your own people, want to leave Haiti? It's because of the uh, social politics situation out there. So they want a better life. There's a big community, Asian community here in Montreal, and people want to leave uh, Haiti because of they don't find any jobs. They have a, they have a lot of poverty there, violence there, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of uh, people that uh, want to have a better life for their children, for a better life for themselves, uh, think that it's, uh, it's outside 80, that they can find a better life for mm -hmm. their family and for themselves. Yeah. Wow. Pastor Cynthia and Bertholi Gaspar, thank you both for joining me. Oh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very thank much. You. Canada is a diverse land of immigrants. Paula Gomez came to our country as a refugee 14 years ago from Colombia. She has a heart for migrants and set up an arts project to work with newcomers here in Canada. Now, when Paola saw the migrant caravan, and, or what she calls the exodus, coming from Honduras, she wanted to help those children in that group find a creative outlet. But what she saw on the ground was even more troubling than what she imagined. Sheldon Neal has her story. When I decided to go to Veracruz, Mexico, to meet the caravan, well, it comes from that place of, yeah, I know what it is to, uh, to, to travel with kids. I know what it is to travel with nothing except hope and faith. And I didn't like what the mainstream media was doing, how they were portraying these families, these walkers. So I decided to go and do art to create a space of self-expression, but also to create a space 
in which participants deal with their own feelings and emotions but become more resilient and, and become more creative because a creative person can deal with adversity in a, in a more strong manner, I guess. So I decided that I wanted to go to, to, to Veracruz and do exactly the same. The scene was devastating. At five in the morning, I saw over 4,000 people lining up, waiting for buses that never arrived, with a face, face of disappointment and confusion, with no plan, with no certainty. The only thing they have to hold on is hope and faith. There is a lot of misinformation. At Veracruz, which is almost half of the way before arriving to a, a port of entry, there was no even conversation about how that process looked like. Are you a migrant or are you a refugee? What are, you, what are the reasons for you to leave? And, and, that's, and that looked to me as very problematic because it's like, okay, there is no organization here. It seems that these families are walking but they don't have a clue what they are walking into. Do you think Canada could be doing more to help migrants or even help other people part of the caravan? I'm very troubled by the fact that Canada has kept silence about what is happening in the border, about the 4,000, 5,000 people that were traveling from South America. And I do believe that the fact that there are um, people with no resources, that they didn't have money to buy an airplane ticket. I did have the money to buy an airplane ticket. I did have the a visa to travel across. These people don't even have a passport, so they have to walk. So that will tell you of the resources. That was just four years ago, little Alan Curdy washed up on a beach at a very different destination than his aunt in Vancouver was hoping for. Alan was one of those migrant families who hoped to make a new beginning in Canada. And joining me now are two women who work closely with refugees, Anne Woolger, the founder of Matthew House in Toronto, and Nina Drenth, the house manager of Micah House in Hamilton. And um, both of you gals, thanks so much for the important work you do. And Anne, help us understand uh, what was Canada's response, or could have been Canada's response, on that Alan Curdy story. I think in many ways it was quite commendable in that there was quite an outpouring of emotion and, and people felt very compassionate. And I think that's the, the result was the large um, number of uh, Syrians that were welcome to Canada, the whole program. Oh. So, so actually his tragic photo was perhaps a trigger that helped prepare us to take in the Syrian migrants. Yes. Okay, the, so the confusion, gals, is migrant, refugee, like how do we figure out who's worthy of coming into our welcome? And um, you do it so well at Matthew House. Nina, what, who's worthy of our welcome? When I hear that question, I hear the same thing that the Pharisees asked Jesus, which was, well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> and, he, and he answers by telling the story of the Good Samaritan, right? And he, he was a vulnerable person um, who was on a journey. And uh, the one who gives him welcome is the least likely of them, right? And so then... I think in the Bible, we constantly see kind of the role of the host and the role of the guest kind of intermingling and maybe they're the same thing. And, and you and your husband live in a refugee shelter. You are a house parent. What do you know they need from Canadians? Um, I think the biggest thing that I see um, our newly arrived refugee friends needing is um, a network 
I mean, they need so many things, but I think they need friends. They need a network, and that's for practical reasons. They need to eventually find jobs. They need to eventually find a place to live. Any of us who have ever been to a new place know that you just need so they friends. Need connections. Yeah. And you founded Matthew House to make connections. I, and I, I'm privileged to have been in both of your homes numerous times. But what, where do you think Canadians are right now that we need to understand? We're looking at the migrant court, the, the, you know, the border fright, all of these things. Is it as frightening as we suspect to be wide open to migrants? Um, I don't think Canadians need to fear at all. Um, I don't think, uh, particularly along the Canadian border, everything is much more in control than... Um, Even though we've had a lot of political talk that it is out of control, yeah. that it's too open. Yeah. We've had hundreds walking over every month, Montreal, Manitoba, yeah. different places. Yeah. No, as Back. one that's, I've been 30 years now working and I'm involved in national committees, um, the border is actually much better organized than we think. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of systems getting in place by the government that are making um, things that are improving in terms of the whole refugee claimant system. I don't think Canadians should fear. I think the thing that Canadians should focus on is how can we welcome claimants. And that's certainly what we've tried to do at, at Matthew House is just to, to create a welcoming environment because in the long run we benefit as a nation mm -hmm. by welcoming these people well and by giving them a positive start and I, I i mean i could tell so many stories of the people that have come through the doors of matthews over the the last 20 years we've had about 2,000 from over 100 <laughs> different nations and some of them are highly skilled professionals some of them are but I think the primary thing, they all have a fear of persecution and a need for protection, but they also have a huge desire to give back to Canada. They are so grateful for the welcome they receive at places like Matthew House and Micah House and others, and they want to give. But the most important thing I think Canada's, Canadians can give is that welcome, that understanding. I remember one time you were on this show and you told me afterwards, I've got two here, have no place for Thanksgiving dinner. And, and I I still remember, our whole family remembers, that was an amazing Thanksgiving dinner at our house with people who couldn't speak any English, but they needed, they needed networks, they needed yeah. connections. Thank you both. Your spots will both be up on the websites, and um, we will make sure we do what we can to get Canadians connected to welcoming the migrant crisis. Thank you both. Thank you. We'll be right back with my wrap. Crisis, we love using that word, but when it comes to welcoming the stranger, Canada is not in a crisis on migrants. Our border is tremendously secure. Our refugee processing is a model to the world. Where there is a crisis is in compassion and welcome to the thousands in the queue of Canada. Let's do our part to support those newcomers to the agencies that are helping them and grant them the rights and dignity of safety and a new hearing until their cases can be heard for that chance. Okay, lots of learning to do on our website, lots of great agencies to connect with. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again next week.